Hi, this is the Sunday Night Update on Hurricane Dorian. As always, this is just my thoughts on the big picture. If you need to make decisions regarding your local area, consult your local officials for the best information about how the storm may impact you and what kind of preparations and actions may be necessary. And if you receive an evacuation order, please heed it. We've had a lot happen today. This has been quite a day. Uh, we can clearly see the hurricane here this morning and early afternoon. Dorian underwent a period of rapid intensification on approach to the northern Bahamas, and as it approached the island of Great Abaco, uh, it bottomed out uh, to a pressure of about 911 millibars and attained winds of 185 miles per hour making it by far a Category 5 on the Saffir-Simpson scale, and tied with several other storms for the second strongest hurricane ever in the Atlantic Basin in the modern record uh, with those winds. So this is, this is a monster that we're dealing with here, and unfortunately for the Abaco Islands and Grand Bahama, the storm has slowed down as expected, moving nearly due westward here, and you can see that there's the island right there, has been suffering from the eye of the storm for the entire afternoon. This has been a long and drawn out event, and we hope that everyone in these islands are okay. Uh, but prolonged conditions will continue as the storm gradually moves westward. We can see this now on Miami radar. This is courtesy of Mark Nissenbaum at FSU. You can see this powerful eye wall showing up and just crawling westward um, at maybe seven miles per hour right now, somewhere around there. And you can see that the island of Grand Bahama is uh, not far from starting to see the influence of this eye wall, and we'll see if it gets far enough to affect Freeport on the western side of the island, uh, but this is now crawling over and is expected to get to somewhere in this area before it makes its turn more toward the northwest and north. Somewhere just offshore of the Florida coastline is the current expectation, and we'll keep talking about this here. But first, regarding the intensity of the storm, it has crossed over this island, and these islands do induce a little bit of friction. They're pretty flat, so they're not really weakening the storm. The recon plane went in there just now and found that uh, since lunchtime, when the pressure was about 9.11, the pressure is now 9.16. So the storm has leveled off, probably due to interaction with the island, which just uh, just knocks it down just a tad, uh, but the winds remain extreme uh, over 175 miles per hour on some of this data, and we'll see what the plane finds when it comes in through the other uh, part of the storm after this video is done. Uh, but as this comes westward now, it is getting slower, it's still interacting with some of these islands, and there may be some upwelling of cooler water now that the storm is moving slower. It will take some time for that effect to occur, but by tomorrow and tomorrow night we might start seeing the impacts of colder water as this starts crawling in this area and this water gets cooler underneath. Another thing to watch for is the storm structure. This is a broader look at it from the Bahamas radar network as of about 30 minutes ago when I record this. The Miami, the Miami radar cannot see quite far enough out to get this structure yet, but if we look at the Bahamas radar, we can see the primary eye wall, and we can also see evidence of the secondary band trying to form on the outskirts of the storm, and this could over time form a more complete ring and form maybe some sort of secondary eye wall that tries to contract and encircle the inner eye wall, and that could initiate an eye wall replacement cycle if that occurs. It isn't uh, in progress yet. The recon plane did not find a very significant wind maximum with this band, and this eye wall remains uh, by far uh, very strong and the primary uh, core of the storm. But if we do get a secondary eye wall, that can mean a couple of things. It normally forebodes a period of uh, gradual weakening of the storm, and it also foreshadows a broadening of the storm's wind field, because when the storm weakens, it expands a little bit during that process. Uh, and then it can re-strengthen after the eye wall replacement cycle completes, but that's going to be something to watch for over the next couple of days, along with the effects of ocean cooling. Those are the two things that might start weakening the storm just a little bit as it comes west and then northwest. And that would, of course, be heralded as good news for Floridians on the eastern coast here, but there might be a reason to think that that's not such a great thing, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Now regarding the track of this storm, here's the water vapor loop, here's Florida, and here's the storm coming through the Bahamas. Our steering features of note uh, continue to be this mid-level ridge, this little thin dark gray area here which is pushing the storm westward at the moment toward Florida, but we also have this trough coming into the Ohio Valley. You can see it here pushing eastward into the eastern U.S. That is starting to push down. You can see the edge of it here pushing through Tennessee. That's going to start weakening this ridge that's north of Dorian. And with time, that's going to erase 
part of the westerly flow that's or easterly flow that's guiding the storm toward Florida and is going to allow it to sort of start uh, slowing down and turning more toward the north as this ridge weakens. And that's the primary evolution that's occurring. And we still have a little bit of disagreements between some of the models on the track, and it's going to be a close call. I'll take you through some of the uh, potential track evolutions that we have today on our latest model data. This is the European run from this morning showing the storm just before it approached the, Abago, uh, the Abaco Islands. And we have uh, Monday morning. It'll be uh, over Grand Bahama on the model, and then Tuesday morning you can see it barely moves. This is really slowing down here. You can also see it's getting pretty close to Florida on this run. This is about uh, 50 nautical miles, so about 60 uh, statute miles from the Florida coastline, and you can see the wind field uh, getting pretty close to the coast. This then comes up the coast, and by Wednesday morning it's still something like 60-70 miles off the coast and then it continues northward here, staying offshore, but getting pretty close to the Carolinas, and then moving on up and actually making landfall in Cape Hatteras. And this is going to be something we'll be talking about a lot more once we get past Florida. A uh, big threat to the coastline up here may be uh, in store, even if the storm technically misses Florida. And I, I feel like pointing out here, this is still a track that can cause major problems for Florida. A storm 50 to 70 miles offshore here, we're talking about storms surge flooding that could occur in a big way similar to what Hurricane Matthew did as it came up the coast parallel like this in a similar fashion. That could be a good analogy for the areas that could receive flooding. Every storm is different. Don't assume it's going to be the same as Matthew, but we remember what Matthew did without making landfall. This could be a similar situation and the wind field while the eye wall would be offshore would still cause widespread power outages in regions that get tropical storm force winds of 40 miles per hour or higher. So do keep in mind that there are still severe impacts from the storm even if it is offshore. We have a similar situation with uh, the GFS which shows again the system uh, this morning over the Bahamas uh, coming westward moving very slowly on uh, Monday afternoon and Monday night and you can see it comes northwestward a little bit closer to the coast than on the European. It is about, uh, let's see here, about 50 miles offshore, 60 statute miles offshore on the GFS and then it continues up and uh, really close to the coast and all along here we're talking about storm surge and, and major potential flooding problems even if the center is offshore and then again a landfall in North Carolina and the storm would be weaker by this point but it could still be a category two or three hurricane or something like this depending on how much ocean upwelling occurs we're not exactly sure how strong it'll be yet depending on how close to Florida it gets and how it interacts with the Gulf Stream but this would be a pretty major event by Carolina standards which don't normally get major hurricanes and and this could still be one by the time it gets up there. We'll have to see. But that's a few days away still. Uh, while we're still talking about Florida here, there is one model that uh, gets this a little closer and in fact has a landfall and it's the H wharf that still tries to get it in. Uh, this shows the same kind of path, but instead of staying offshore as the other models do, it actually comes into Cape Canaveral and makes a landfall here. This would be the worst case scenario for the Florida East Coast in the sense that the eye wall would of course be coming ashore and we would get the strongest winds. Now a couple of things to note about a run like this. You'll see that the storm is a Cat 5 here in the Bahamas at 911 millibars. Note how much the storm weakens as it approaches Florida and that's because there's cold water upwelling underneath the storm right in here. Now there is the Gulf Stream and there's a thin band of water in here that's very warm but it might not prevent all of the ocean cooling that's expected to happen as the storm slows down. So we are expecting some degree of weakening of Dorian. Now it would still be a major hurricane at this point, probably not Cat 5, but still a menace and so the winds would be something to take very seriously. But the other thing I want to point out is that regardless of whether or not the storm weakens, uh, we would have a major storm surge flooding uh, regardless of the maximum winds in the eye wall and we would also have the potential for inland flooding from rain and obviously the winds themselves could be very damaging even if they're not 180 miles per hour, 120, 140 will do the trick too. Those, those would be pretty bad. So keep in mind this will be nasty even if you hear the word weakening over the next couple of days. The storm is weakening. It sounds like good news, but the storm is still going to be very powerful, so take it seriously and take evacuation orders seriously. 
Now the question of course on your mind is going to be, well, is this track inland on the H wharf more or less likely than the track just offshore shown by the European and GFS models? There is some reason to believe that the H wharf might be onto something. We don't know for sure. But one of the things to keep in mind is that if we look at the steering for the storm, this is the GFS area average sounding in this red box here around the storm. This is basically a steering flow showing uh, at different vertical levels of the atmosphere these wind barbs on the right. Uh, we see that there's the southeasterly steering flow in the lower layer that's trying to push the storm into Florida here on the thumbnail. And in the upper levels of the atmosphere, we have westerly flow from that trough coming down in that high over the Gulf. And that's trying to keep the storm off of the coast. And the hurricane is following the net effect of all of these steering layers together. And that net flow on the GFS is almost due north or north-northwest, which keeps the storm just offshore. Now, if the lower layer wins, uh, then the storm would come farther west because the lower layer has more influence. How could the lower layer get more influence? Well, one way is through changing how deep the vortex is. If we look at the GFS cross-section through the storm, if you look at the thumbnail here, I've drawn a line through the storm, and this is the wind field. And so you can see the eye in here in the center, and then the two eye walls on either side, and you can see the storm extends very strongly up to about this 150 millibar layer, and even up at 100 millibars at the top of the plot, we see a dip in these temperature contours, indicating that the vortex is very strong up to 150, 100 millibars. Bars. If you look at the H wharf at the same time, you'll see that especially if you concentrate on the purple contour here, it's a little bit shallower. The storm is a little bit shorter on the H wharf. It doesn't extend above 150 millibars and the wind field is a little bit shorter. And this matters because if the vortex is uh, not as tall as it is on the GFS, it's not going to feel the steering flow in this upper layer quite as much. And so more of the steering contribution comes from the lower layer, which could mean a component of motion more toward the west, which is why we have this landfall on the H wharf compared to the GFS or Euro. That's my current best guess. And the reason the H-Wharf has a shorter vortex is because it's weaker because of the ocean upwelling. The GFS isn't going to see the upwelling because it's not a coupled model, and the European isn't resolving the storm very well, so it also doesn't have as much ocean upwelling as the H-Wharf does. So, this is one reason why a weakening storm may not be the best news ever for Florida specifically, because if the ocean is cooling under this and it's weakening on approach, that weakening may actually result in it getting a little bit farther to the west and potentially on shore. So this is going to be some of the details we're watching over the next day or two, but keep in mind that this is still a play-by-play -play kind of situation. We do not know if it's going to get on shore. The official forecast still says the most likely outcome is that it grazes the coast about 50 miles offshore but does not make landfall. We do have hurricane warnings though for a portion of the coast just in case the hurricane force wind field uh, does reach to the coast and we, we simply don't know at this point whether the storm is going to wobble around within this cone of uncertainty. Remember the cone does extend inland. We could see a track just a little bit more toward the left and that could bring the storm on shore like we just showed you and this is something to keep in mind. You should be preparing along the coast as if the eye will come ashore better safe than sorry folks uh, heed your local officials and the advice and evacuation warnings that they give and uh, do stay safe there's still time to prepare but not that much more time that's it for tonight thanks for watching